and welcome to today's uh, first keynote, which is uh, being given by Dr. Phil Legg, who is an associate professor at in cybersecurity and is also program leader for the uh, MSc security at the University of West of England in Bristol, or UE as the natives call it. Um, Actually, if it had only been a few more kilometers to the west, it would actually have been the uh, University of the East of Bristol. Um, but uh, going there, uh, just a little bit further south, we actually find the uh, University of, uh, or Cardiff University, where Phil completed his PhD in 2010. His research in, uh, interests uh, uh, go all around cybersecurity. Uh, he's looking at how machine learning, visual analytics, and human computer interaction are adopted within cybersecurity. And this bodes for a very interesting keynote. So please, Phil, go ahead. Thank you, Martin, for a very kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's keynote. So bear with me one moment while I just bring up some slides. OK, hopefully that's visible for you all. So I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about um, Advancing cybersecurity education in a post COVID world, uh, which is one of the main themes of this year's cyber science conference. Okay, so just a bit more about myself. As Martin's already said, I'm Associate Professor in Cybersecurity at University of West of England. I'm also the program leader for our NCSC certified MSc cybersecurity course. And most recently, I've become the co director of UE Cyber which is our NCSC recognized academic center of excellence in cybersecurity education. And that's really, you know, one of the big things that we're focusing on at the moment um, around how we do um, cybersecurity education, not just within the university, but reaching out across our region. Um, my research interests, again, as already touched on briefly, look at cybersecurity and how machine learning and data visualization feed into those thinking about things such as insider threat detection, cyber situational awareness, and also adversarial AI. Just a little bit about some of the research projects I've been involved in over the last couple of years. Um, I'm involved in connected autonomous vehicles research, looking at uh, security principles of uh, an autonomous bus that will be running between um, Fife and Edinburgh up in Scotland. Uh, as they looking at um, how we can ensure that the bus is operating safely in a secure environment, uh, obviously traveling over a bridge, water, all these kind of things. There's the Umbrella Project, which is with South Gloucestershire and Toshiba. And this is a, a 5G network uh, across South Bristol, uh, sorry, South Gloucestershire, um, looking at industrial IoT, looking at again, connected autonomous vehicles. And again, what are the challenges in terms of cybersecurity when we're looking at 5G connectivity, um, a rapid increase of devices connecting to these networks and requiring um, feedback and response in, you know, instantaneously almost. The third project looks at um, Scout, which is essentially a, a digital forensics platform but is work with Avon and Somerset Police and Synologic Innovations. And this is looking around cybercrime and again, how data analytics visualization can be used for being able to conduct data provenance, um, blockchain investigations, Bitcoin transactions, and how do you couple this with dark web activity? And then finally to mention is our work in AI security, which is looking at how we actually explain what's happening within AI models and therefore, if we can explain it, can we also understand where the vulnerabilities in those models may sit? And that's work we've been doing for a number of years with um, a company called Monvia up in Tewkesbury, and more recently in the last few years with TechModal, who are based in Bristol. So I just wanted to start off with a bit of a roundup of some of the research. There's a lot of research in this area, as we well know, and we've seen throughout this, the talks this week. But bringing it back to this core theme, um, but well, one of the core themes of this conference this week, which has been looking at advancing cybersecurity education in a post-COVID world. And we, we all know it's been a very, very strange year. Um, you know, a lot of things have changed, including how conferences are operating. Um, 
which, you know, it brings its own challenges. It brings benefits as well. I'm able to present at a conference in Dublin about travel and all the rest of it. Of course, I wish we were all there. I wish we were there in person. Um, things such as networking and collaboration, it's much harder to strike up online. But nevertheless, you know, we are, we are finding these new ways to work to be able to achieve what we want to do. So I've mentioned already that UE back in December were very fortunate to be named as one of one of seven gold NCSC academic centers of excellence in cybersecurity education, along with two silver uh, ACSEs as well. And what this is really about is saying, okay, you're doing work with the students that you have at the university and that's all well and good and that's been certified and that's been recognized by NCSC in terms of the master's provision we offer. But, you know, what, what else are you offering into this space? How are we educating those outside of the computer science department in terms of cybersecurity education? Because, you know, we've got people in the business school who are doing work which inevitably will touch upon this if we think about large organizations they need to understand security we think about psychology departments and we think about insider threats and what what is the motivation for someone to act as an as an attacker as a threat and actually you know deploy a ransomware campaign or whatever it might be and so we've got to speak with psychologists to understand that and actually we've got to speak with our education department as well because you know we've got an education department and education faculty in fact um, who, you know, their, their knowledge and research is about how do you do good education? So it kind of seems a bit bizarre if you're not talking to them about, well, actually, what does make for, for good education? So, so one of the pieces around this is how do we, how do we promote better cybersecurity education, not just within our own de department, but actually across the entire university? It's about how do we, as academics, work with practitioners such as our IT services department and essentially practice what we preach because it's all well and good if we're in a lecture saying, well, you know, this is the, this is the kind of appliance you need to deploy in terms of doing inside intrusion detection systems. And then saying, oh yeah, but you know, we, we don't do any of those ourselves operationally because you know, we, we just don't want to. And so it really is about being able to demonstrate that we practice what we preach. We work with our IT teams to be able to see, well, you know, what are the real world challenges that they face as, you know, as an organization, because of course we are an educational institute, but we are an organization that is responsible for uh, many thousands of students and staff and maintaining the cybersecurity of them. So there's a number of different factors there. And I suppose the last piece I should mention that is also about outreach and engagement. And so we have a very, very good outreach project that's been running for a number of years called Unlock Cyber, which has been all about getting schools and industry in the local region together to learn about cybersecurity. And this normally takes place in December as a large scale workshop for year eight students to learn about cybersecurity, to get a taste of you know, a few activities, and really just to kind of pit their interest to say, right, how can I, how can I turn that thing that I really enjoy doing into a career path? And that's a really important point that I'll touch on as we go through. Any other piece also to mention is Gloucestershire College. Um, we have a good working relationship with Gloucestershire College and we offer a degree apprenticeship with them uh, that again has uh, recently been recognized by the NCSC. And the important thing about the degree apprenticeship is that this is another way of learning. This is you know, obviously students who want to get a job and have a, build their education whilst working. And this is a trend which we are starting to see um, that people, uh, people want to do, okay? So it's a really, really important way of being able to get that knowledge that's being taught out into real world practice. Okay. So in terms of advancing cybersecurity education then, what does cybersecurity education currently look like? And we've touched on a little bit of this already. And we've got schools and colleges and there might be uh, computing programs that they're doing they might be getting involved in uh, extracurricular activities through such schemes as ncsc cyber first um but really i mean you know there's there's a bit of activity happening in schools and colleges and it's then trying to connect that with 
the next bit of the puzzle. OK, so if we look at a traditional uh, education route, let's say the next piece might be the universities. And obviously that's where where I sit. Um, and we've got universities, some of which have this NCSC certified status, which is great. Um, but as I've already started touching on, you know, you've got this traditional full time me method of study, whether you're looking at a kind of three year undergraduate program, might be three year plus a year in industry, it might be master's level. But then there's also things like degree apprenticeships coming about um, more so nowadays. Obviously, they, they've been a thing for many years, but they are starting to gain more popularity. And the key thing there is students are starting to think, well, OK, well, what's what's right for me? You know, what is the route that I want to take? And again, it's that whole thing trying to cultivate what is it you enjoy doing and how do you make a career out of the thing that you enjoy doing? There's also industry certifications and you know, many people on, on this call will be aware of things like CEH and Security Plus, CompTIA, uh, CISSP. Um, and there are a lot of industry certifications recognized and there are a lot of training providers who will support people to study those programs. And then the one thing that's been growing over the last couple of years is the self-taught online labs kind of route. So, we look at things like Try Hack Me, Hack the Box, Immersive Labs, and these are really good tools for being able to actually play around with um, materials that are available online, being able to work through exercises to, you know, can you, can you gain this flag? Can you gain access to a, a vulnerable machine? And how did you do that? Answering questions along the way. And that's, that's a really interesting piece for those who are passionate about subject, interested about subject, and basically want to go off and play around with stuff by themselves. So that's, that's a really interesting route that's been cropping up over recent years. And is that updated? Why? Ah, yes, okay. And I suppose there's a couple of questions I just want to throw in at this point, because I'm talking about um, the current offering of what's out there for cybersecurity education. And so we've got to think, well, why would somebody want an education in cybersecurity? Are they doing it because um, you know, they, they love tinkering around with computers and they want to know more? Are they doing it because they've heard there's lots of money in industry and they want to earn lots of money and get a good job? Um, or is it something in between? Okay, And we've got to try and think, well, what, what is the driving force for someone wanting to come and study cybersecurity? And I guess also I think about, well, why did you get into cybersecurity or why did I get into cybersecurity? How did that happen? And it's quite interesting because currently you hear a lot about building these cybersecurity pathways. You know, what is the pathway that a 12 year old student should take in order to work in cybersecurity? And the, the problem with a, a question like that is when you ask most people, they'll say, well, you know, I, I didn't follow a pathway. I, I kind of made my own pathway. I, I did a bit of this and I did a bit of that. And suddenly one day I ended up doing the thing I'm doing now. And so it, there, there isn't, you know, a clear one size fits all. There isn't this kind of clear pathway. Um, you know, for myself, I started out because I enjoyed playing around with computers. I did a computer science degree. I enjoyed doing that. So I stayed on, did a PhD in the area, played around a lot with machine learning and visualization stuff. And then an opportunity arose where someone said, right, well, how about doing that in cybersecurity and helping defend, defend against the bad guys? And I said, hey, that sounds great. And, you know, the rest is history, so to speak. So it's really, it's really about trying to pin down well, what, what makes someone think this is a career path for me. And again, if I think about my own experience, it stems back to the days of playing around on a BBC micro, coding up in basic, making things do what something they're not supposed to do. Um, you know, there's a, a great one that my mum would always talk about of how I managed to put the three bears in the bath when they weren't supposed to be on, on some sort of educational programme when I was young. And that, you know, is really about hacking. I, I was playing around with a computer. I managed to make it do something it wasn't supposed to do. Um, that's where it all started for me. So it's really important to emphasize this, this fact that there is no one size fits all approach. But what we do need to capitalize on is building that spark, building that, that passion and enthusiasm so that people say, well, 
yeah, I really enjoyed doing that one thing, right? How do I spend the rest of the days in my career doing more things like that? Then there's another question that I want to just put out there. Of what does a cybersecurity expert need to know? And this question, again, is often thrown around in discussions like this. And there's the NCSC Cybersecurity Body of Knowledge, the CYBOC, which has been developed over the last couple of years. And this is a great resource for being able to um, clearly start to gather what the picture of cybersecurity looks like. Uh, currently, there's 19 knowledge areas and there are more in progress. And this covers things such as network security, malware attack technologies, human factors, security operations, instant management, cryptography, the list goes on. Um, but the important thing to recognize again is that it's not saying that everyone needs to know all of these things. It's saying, right, here are the topics that the NCSE would consider in scope of cybersecurity. But what are the things that spark you? You know, if you enjoy human factors, great. And then there's an interesting piece going on with degrees at the moment about piecing together which of the degrees look like which areas of the cyborg. So you can say, ah, I want to do that course because that course focuses on human factors, or I want to do that course because it focuses on network security. So again, it's about making people think, well, you know, what, what is it they want to do with their time? Um, how do you want to capitalize on that so that you can turn that, that passion and interest into the career path? At this point, I just want to throw up um, some, of, some of the interesting figures reported by the government in the cybersecurity skills in the UK labour market 2020 report. So some of the things being presented here then, looking at uh, 653,000 businesses, 48% from their study, have a basic skills gap, understanding firewalls, managing personal data, handling malware, and 408,000 or 30% have a, an advanced skills gap, pen testing, forensics, architecture. Okay, so even at this basic skills gap, they're saying that you know, nearly, nearly half of the businesses that were surveyed as part of this report have this basic, um, this, this gap of knowledge in trying to deal with these, these things. They're also saying that the skills gap covers both technical and non-technical. And this is a really important point to emphasize because they're saying, you know, we might have someone who's very good technically, but you know, in terms of their non-technical ability, their communication skills, how they can actually convey what is happening in a technical domain to those in a non-technical aspect of the business, um, that might be an area which is lacking. And that's a really important thing to think about because the whole point, point of cybersecurity is, well, think about the thing you're trying to protect and protect it, okay? And if we're looking at organizational aspects and businesses, this is about communication between the IT team, the technical team, and say the C-level board to be able to make them see, you know, why should I invest 100,000 pound in, in this new firewall kit? You know, what's my return on investment there? And if you can't convey what the return on investment would be, why is that important from a business perspective, then unfortunately you're gonna lose the argument fairly quickly. So it's, it's really important to be able to impress upon students and learners why we need the technical knowledge that underpins security and computer science, but also why we need the non-technical skills as well to be able to do that conversation piece. There's also another finding that says it's not common for businesses overall to invest in training for staff in cyber roles. 24% of companies have done so far. And I thought this was a really interesting um, point to raise because they're saying they want, they want people with the expertise, the skills, the knowledge and all the rest of it. But at the same time, you know, if there's also that lack of training being put in from a business perspective, you know, how can you ensure that you are helping your staff to keep up to date with the knowledge, keep up to date with the domain and actually investing in your staff as people um, so that you know, they feel valued and um, supported in their career development. So I think that's an important thing to, to flag. So the last one to point out is around seven in 10 cybersecurity businesses um, have tried to recruit someone in a cyber role within the last three years. 
and they've reported a third of these being hard to fill, okay? And 51% of cases hard to fill general cyber roles. And again, this, this is a really important thing that we need to focus on because there are wealth of graduates out there from cybersecurity courses, but also from other related disciplines. And yet we're being told, well, why these roles are hard to fill? Well, <laughs> the question is, you know, what is the expectation of a graduate? What is an, a, a company looking to actually recruit? There have been a number of cases where we've seen job adverts come out. They're saying, oh, I want someone who's just graduated from a course who's got a CISSP and they've got five years of technical knowledge and backgrounds. And you just think, well, you know, are you searching for a unicorn in terms of what you're, what you're hoping to recruit? So there's some work to be done around that piece as well. So I just wanna throw up some challenges. And again, you know, this is to hopefully provoke some discussion as we go on uh, into the Q&A later. But why do students want an education in cybersecurity? You know, what, what is their end goal? Is it because they want to get a job or is it because they enjoy learning more? You know, they enjoy to learn more. And really, I mean, you know, recognizing the day and age that we are in, um, graduate employability being a big thing that is looked upon in terms of HE, but also recognizing, you know, as academics, why did we get into this profession in the first place? We enjoy educating students. We want to pass on our enthusiasm and knowledge and passion for that subject, we want to be able to you know, share that with them. So there is a bit of an onus on us as how do we help them to achieve both? How do we help them secure that job? Yes. But more importantly, how do we help them to want to develop themselves, want to explore more? Because that is going to be a really, really, really important aspect to all of this. Um, because there, there will always be more to learn. So how does the student progress after university? Again, we've just started touching on this a little bit. How do they continue their education when cyber is constantly changing? You know, we often hear this term, it's cyber security is constantly changing. I'll save the debate on that for another time, but one thing we can at least appreciate is that more and more devices are being connected, more and more data is being gathered. Um, there is a greater reliance on technology underpinning everything we are doing as a society. Um, there is greater reliance on software packages and software packages might be updated. Um, and therefore there is a need to continually learn. You know, a new API comes out, right? I've got to learn, I've got to sit down, I've got to learn how to interact with that in order to make the thing that I've built actually work. Okay, so we've got to impress upon them that, you know, what you, what you learn at university isn't necessarily going to be, you know, this is, this is the thing you need to know to do cybersecurity, off you go and there you are. Um, it's about impressing upon them that this is, really is the tip of the iceberg and that there is much more for them to explore and, you know, find out about through their own lifelong learning, their continual learning. And that, again, is a critical point that universities need to be um, impressing more upon students. <clears throat> and then there's these barriers, you know, what barriers exist and how do we break them? And I've started touching on this a bit already, this expectation gap, you know, we've got graduates, we've got a lot of graduates with a lot of good technical uh, expertise, technical and non-technical. And then you've got what an employer thinks they're looking for. And it's how do we marry up these two things, you know, recognizing, you know, what is what is the responsibility of the individual? What's the responsibility of um, education institutes? And what's the responsibility of an employer? And again, that's, that's something that really does need to be addressed um, if we're ever gonna combat this, this skills gap that exists. There's also an interesting debate around how we encourage diversity so that we achieve diverse solutions. Um, I'm a big, big believer in diversity, especially so with cybersecurity because we want people who are going to think in different ways because we know, you know if, that attackers, attackers are naturally going to think in different ways because by the very nature, they're trying to circumvent what is existing already. They're trying to get around that. And so if we as a team are not diverse, how will we ever possibly think in diverse ways such that we can say, oh, well, actually, maybe they've tried to do this instead of the norm. 
So diversity is really, really important. But again, how do we, how do we articulate that when a, an employer is putting together a job application? It's, it's a very hard challenge. You know, I'm not suggesting we have the answers at this moment in time, but hopefully these are questions to stimulate further debate. And there is also a question about what the reality of the skills gap is. Um, as I say, we've got a lot of graduates. Um, you know, we see a lot from our own university and likewise there are a lot from other very, very good universities around the rest of the UK. Um, so <clears throat> what is the reality of the skills gap? Um, and arguably, are there some in, in marketing and the like who actually use that term skills gap um, to their advantage? If we, they think about how they push their own courses, qualifications, training, whatever it might be. And there is really an issue that needs to be looked at as to what the reality of that skills gap is. So then in terms of the pandemic, and obviously, as we've said, you know, the pandemic has changed a lot of how we're thinking about education. Obviously, we've had 14 months or so um, of operating largely online. There's been a little bit of um, hybrid learning where we've been returning to campus, but with the majority of our students online. And it really has changed a lot in terms of how we approach our teaching, how we think about our teaching, and probably more importantly, how we think about our teaching going forward. You know, how, how is this gonna impact on the next five academic years, for instance? What are the things we can keep? What are the things which we say, we tried it in an emergency situation, it didn't quite work for us, we don't want to have to do that again. So it's really important to think, right, what, what did work, what didn't work? Um, there's also a question of how the blended online learning is perceived by students within education versus training debates. As I mentioned, there's a lot of very good training providers out there who will you know, say, right, we've got a training course online. These are the videos, watch the videos, do your multiple choice exam, you've got your qualification. And that is, you know, that is very good. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, so how do we ensure that education and training are seen as clearly distinct things? Because training is about how you, uh, how you can essentially learn a, a narrow focus about a particular thing and demonstrate you understand that. The education piece is a lot broader than that. It's about that whole inquiring mind piece. It's about the critical thinking. It's not just taking things on a surface level, but, you know, wanting to be able to lean in closer, poke things a bit and say, well, you know, why does it work in that way? And then saying, right, if that's how it works, how am I going to break it? You know, if we're thinking about a security aspect. Another question to put out there, has it made students reevaluate what they want from a university education? And also what is the perceived financial value of university education when delivered online? These are really important questions that we do need to be asking ourselves. And it, it does also come back to that piece of, well, why does a student choose to go to university in the first place? What are they hoping to get out of it? And the more we focus on, you know, what is the thing that got you into your, your interest in computing or cyber or whatever it is in the first place, you know, as educators, I wanna know that information and I want to capitalize on that so that I am helping to inspire and build upon that, that interest that you once had. I don't want to be the person who essentially has killed that subject to death and made you think, right, I never want to touch it again. And again, that's, that's a job on, on us as educators to try and inspire that passion. OK, so as I say, has it made us reevaluate how we educate? You know, value of pre-recorded materials versus live discussions. And... There, there is a good, lot of value to pre-recorded materials. It allows us to be able to present things in a much more condensed format than we might have done in a traditional lecture theatre, for instance. But then there's also got to be that piece for live discussion, um, that opportunity to hear back from students, to be able to contribute to a discussion and say, OK, now we're, we're looking at this particular protocol or we're looking at this kind of case study. And actually hearing from students how they thought about that case study, how they identified, you know, where the security problems might have been and how they might have solved that themselves. And again, you know, how we encourage that live discussion, that has been a challenge. There's no two ways about it in terms of how to promote student engagement online. Um, it's something we've been obviously working on, but it has been a challenge for us and for other HE providers around the country. 
It's also another question about what does a practical session mean when delivered online? Um, you know, in a traditional world, we would, we would typically run things like lectures and practicals. And when you've got a practical session online, you kind of think, well, okay, does that need to be a practical session or is it more about the discussion? Because really it's about, this is an opportunity to see and speak with your tutors. Let's have a discussion about this and then take the practical work when the students are conducting self-study. Okay, so it really is making us think, you know, especially going forward, what are the things that we, we take away from the pandemic and think, right, can this make us re-evaluate re how we're teaching? So then in terms of advancing this, cyber, this cybersecurity education, again, thinking about online learning. How do we ensure online learning is not just seen as YouTube? You know, I don't want to just say, here are all the videos online, go watch the videos and I'll see you at the end of the term. You know, that's not really what it's all about. It's got to have that engagement where students feed back to us. And what we've found has been working really nicely is where we've had interactivity, where we've encouraged them not just to say, switch on your mic and talk to us because we know, we know that that doesn't work. Um, you know, you might get some students engaging and obviously that's great, but you know, for a large majority of your class, you're leaving them behind. And again, the challenge on us as educators is how do we bring everyone along on the journey with us? So just some of the things that we've found that have worked quite nicely here. Um, there's a particular module where I've run a, a choose your own adventure, okay? style feedback. Um, I was a big fan of choose your own adventure books when I was when I was a lad and it was always you know if you want to do this turn to page 10 if you want to do that turn to page 20 and you actually get to choose the narrative of where it's going and the more we can encourage our online sessions to run like that you know obviously once once we've covered you know the core material for a session then actually having students direct what they want to talk about you know do you want do you want to talk about network protocols or do you want to talk about virtual private networking? You choose, okay? And actually have the students steering the conversation rather than the academic coming along and say, right, today, this is what we will talk about. That's worked really nicely for them to feel included in terms of um, you know, where that discussion is going, why it's going in that way, and really allow them to make the most of you know, what the information they can draw from, from us as academics. And likewise, walkthroughs. So again, we've been able to do a lot in terms of screen sharing and practical examples and actually getting students to work along with us when we say, right, today we're going to do an exercise on X. Let's all walk through and see how we get on. But the feedback from audience is critical in this. Um, it's, it's, it has been a challenge and there's no two ways about it, where especially when a, a session ends up being quiet, when it ends up being one sided from a lecturer. So how we encourage this, you know, very much quizzes and polls, they work really well when students don't necessarily want to speak up or be seen. But actually, you know, the opportunities for speaking up and being seen are more suitable for one-to-one -one sessions, okay, rather than trying to put them on the spot in a large, large group. The last point on this slide, just to make, is about that point I've been mentioning already, as an academic, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about the subject that I teach and I want to inspire students. And it's just making sure that we capitalize on why it is we got into the job that we do and how do we do that in a new setting? It's about inspiring students. It's making them want to know more. And it is a, it is a performance, you know, you've probably gathered already. I like to wave my arms around a bit, but you know, I like to think that if students can see me getting passionate about something, and actually, you know, that coming through in the delivery, um, it might inspire them to be passionate about it as well. So this is this is really important because if I want them to be passionate, if I don't come across as passionate, it, it falls flat again. So this is really, really, really important. And again, online, this is an even greater challenge to be able to do. I probably wave my arms around even more than I would do in a, in a lecture theatre online. But this is really important just for being able to make sure that we are engaging students, you know, they are, they are, you know, on the other side of the camera that I've got here, for instance, I hope that there are students on this call today actually you know, paying attention and infused by what I'm saying here today, rather than this being a passive experience and finding out that we're actually watching the, you know, the football instead of 
the, the conference. So hopefully, hopefully that's given you um, some of my insights from the, the last, last year or so. Um, and as I say, you know, I hope that some of this provokes a few questions and discussion for our Q&A that will take place shortly after. And I just wanted to, to bring it back to something which I was actually discussing Tuesday, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but um, one of the things, as I've said about our um, ACSC, is about outreach, and it's about how do we how do we engage with our local community? How do we inspire them in to think, oh, that was really interesting. I'd like to know more about computing and cybersecurity. And we've done a lot of large scale events. Uh, I mentioned the Unlock Cyber one earlier. This is the Empower Cyber where we did Persevero Challenge and also the um, Scale Electrics project that we took out to a number of schools early in 2020 before it was all canned when COVID hit. And again, as I mentioned on Tuesday, we developed a hacking the IoT home workshop that can be delivered remotely. Okay, so hopefully if you didn't see it on Tuesday, hopefully there's a video on demand that you're able to watch. But what I wanted to do here, um, I'm feeling brave, I'm going to try and do a little bit of a live demo here to actually show this. And again, you know, try and impress upon you um, the different kind of things we can do when we're operating online. So I'm going to stop sharing this PowerPoint now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. And if I change my camera, suddenly you can see I'm in a uh, cyber science branded hacker house today. Okay, so here it is. There is my hacker house. And what we see in the hacker house, okay, we've got a number of rooms. Okay, and if I click here, what we can do is actually look around the hacker house. Okay, so I've got various cameras dotted around in various places. Okay, and I can see things around the house, okay? And the challenge, again, just as a brief recap for those who may have missed it the other day, um, this is about how do we do cyber physical security sessions as part of outreach when obviously we are remote and working from home? How do we teach students about uh, IoT home security issues? So what we've developed is a workshop where essentially a student can hack my house okay you're showing the empty slide oh yep that, that, that's fine that's fine um because i'm going to oh now it's right i want to stop the screen share for a minute um hopefully you can see me on a big view um speak of you okay yes fantastic even better right so then if I do something like this, you should also now be able to see a little portion of my screen. Okay, so what we've got here, we've got our two cameras, that's great. And what I'm showing you here is a web page. And for those who are interested, you can play along. Okay, so you, hopefully you can see that. Um, if you want to play along, there is a URL available there, which, Pull up any web browser, type that in. You should be able to, to play along at home. Okay. So let's just see whether that works for anyone. Yep. Okay. Fantastic. So I've got I've got various things happening here because I can see that you are playing along at home. So thank you for the audience participation. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring that over here for the moment, and what I'll do. In fact, we'll give this a test. Oh, there we are. They've typed in the URL in the chat already. So fantastic. They're one step ahead of me. Right. So what I'm going to do, we haven't really got time to do a full on activity, but if I just put something like that in view, you may be able to see a flag. Okay. So you might imagine doing an activity with with a bunch of students and being able to present to them some question where they've got to find an answer okay so can anyone see that flag and if they can can they type it in oh 
Um, um, I see someone's typed it in, but don't forget the um, type it in as as a, a whole with the curly brace and the, the UE prefix. Ah, right. So someone's typed it in, and hopefully with the lighting today, maybe I do that. Okay. So hopefully we could see that you've just changed the color of my lights. Okay. So yeah, there's a couple more doing it now. So that's great. And likewise, then, okay, so here's another flag. Anyone going to type in that one? Come on, blue team. Yeah, okay, so there we are. You've, you've changed my lights from red to blue and back again and all the rest of it. And so you can imagine any any competition, really, any contest. And that's the great thing about a capture a flag exercise. You know, if you go on try hack me and the like, they use capture the flag quite a lot on those those kind of platforms. But what we were trying to do really, oh, ca capital UE if you're typing it in. Um, what we're trying to do here is say, okay, well, you've entered a flag, and rather than just giving you a message on the screen, yes, you you did it. I can see that actually you've you've just changed. The, the colors of my house, you've just hacked my house. And I mean, if, if we've established that we've got come on blue team, come on re red team, um, you know, for those who are ambitious, you might even try other things. So if I type come on green team, I should be able to see, oh yeah, I've changed it green now. So again, you, you might have the student who is inquisitive, you say to them, well, we've got a red and a I don't know what happened there. Hopefully, hopefully you can still hear me and see me. Uh, my Zoom decided to do something very peculiar. Okay, I'm going to assume all is all good now. Fantastic, right? Okay, so so we've done the lighting. Okay, so we can and we can also see that actually there are some parameters which aren't on the cards if students are, um, you know exploring their hacker tendencies, trying to push it to see well, what else exists. Um, here's another one for you. So hopefully you can see that. Um, and there you are. So my, my picture seems to have gone small, but hopefully you can see, hopefully my video is coming through big on your, on your screens. Um, What's happened there? Biggest fan, the flag for biggest fan has triggered a smart switch, which is plugged into the fan. So now you've you've actually created um, a fan activity here. And you could imagine setting this up with a, a ping pong ball, a little ramp or anything like that. You could actually start having a lot of fun with this uh, as a way of inspiring the students to play around with it. And I'm going to do one last. Oh, what, um, Oh, hello, what's happened there? Um, oh, no, I don't want to join a meeting. I want to know. Can somebody just confirm whether you can hear me still? Oh, I'm getting. <laughs> Okay, so well, someone's been able to um, trigger the Hoover, so that's all worked nicely. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I think we've demoed that enough. I'm going to, I don't know why, can one of the organisers just switch on their mic and tell me whether you can hear me still? Um, yes, Phil, we can hear you. Okay, fantastic. Sorry, I, I've got an issue where the Zoom window seems to have disappeared. That's all. Um, so I I can't see anyone. <laughs> I can't see anyone at the moment. But I, I've only got a couple more slides to get through, so um, I can I can figure that one out. Um, bear with me one second. I apologise for for the complication here. Okay, I'm going to just do this 
um, Okay, so there we are. I'm gonna I'm gonna just get by for the last the last few minutes in this kind of way and hope that's okay. Um, as something slightly strange has happened there. So hopefully that gave you a bit of a feel for some of the, the practical exercises we could do. Um, in terms of online delivery. And this is another little example, which I'm not gonna to spend too long talking about this one. Um, but this is a factory, factory simulator tool that we've been playing around with called Factory IO. And it links to an open PLC controller, okay? And that can run on a Raspberry Pi device. And the question really is, can students crash the factory? So can they gain access to the open PLC device when that's made available to them? And can they then reprogram that device by being able to upload a malicious um, ladder logic program for the, the PLC to operate with? And again, the nice thing about this, like the example I've just shown you, is that it's all driven through using a Raspberry Pi, essentially, uh, or at least the Raspberry Pi is the, the point of attack. Um, so it's, it's a nice, simple thing to be able to set up, actually. And it could even be linked with uh, a physical factory environment such as the one shown here um, when we are back on campus and operating properly. Okay, so my last few points, I'm just gonna do this so that you can actually see some of these slides. Okay, so just some of my closing thoughts and discussions. So online learning is not a lift and shift from traditional lectures. Um, you know, we've been operating in a state of emergency um, certainly you know, when the pandemic started. And so it's been trying to work out very quickly what does work, what doesn't work online. Shorter videos work well, live discussions and debate sessions, you know, making it so that there is um, a thread to the conversation that a student can engage with and interactive practical tasks, they've worked well. Um, many universities had actually started adopting online video before the pandemic, but COVID-19 has really accelerated where HE was probably heading by about five years to bring in these new ways of delivery. Online engagement, it is hard. Um, you know, I like being in a classroom with students. That's, you know, again, thinking about why I became an academic. I, I enjoy the teaching and um, inspiration of students. But the question is also, well, what, what motivates the students? You know, why, why has a student signed up for a course and how do we then capitalise on what interests them so that we can um, help them progress in the best possible manner. And how do we rethink these skills that we teach the students to be self-motivated lifelong learners? Because as I say, the point is not to be able to say, this MSE course will cover everything you need to possibly know about cybersecurity. It will only ever give the tip of the iceberg, but it, hopefully it provokes enough kind of, a, of an inquiring mind for students to be able to explore that further. And I think that's really important in cybersecurity and technology in particular, because the tools will change over time. So inevitably we have to adapt to that, we have to continually learn. And then finally, what, what may the future hold? Well, less about the lecture, you know, we can, we can do online videos. We don't need big lecture theaters and the like, um, but it is more about that discussion piece. Um, it's more about engaging students so that we hear from them rather than them just hearing from us. More practice-based learning, online one-to-ones, they've worked really well, actually. When, when students aren't pressured by being on a call with you know, as many as 100, 200 other students, um, having a one-to-one -one with students to just understand where they're at works really nicely online. And there's also that piece about apprenticeships and diverse pathways. We are going to see a lot more in terms of the apprenticeship space. Um, people who say, well, I don't want a traditional academic route. I just want to get a job. Well, maybe the apprenticeship is the way to do that then. Um, and it's really about building this community of scholars, whether we be online, offline or whatever it be. Um, and a key point to emphasize is this expectation gap. There is a big expectation gap. Um, 
how we resolve that it's very much a challenge because there's a lot of competing interests at play obviously employers want to get the best bang for their buck when they're recruiting staff um but at the end of the day we've got a lot of talented people who are coming out of universities who want to get into these career paths it's about finding the companies who say, you know what? Yeah, I'll I'll take a I'll take a shot on this person because they've demonstrated that passion, that enthusiasm, um, the things that we want to see as a company. So, as I say, cultivating passion and enthusiasm, um, in my personal opinion, is absolutely critical. And I'm going to just wrap up with one quote from Albert Einstein that says, "I never teach my pupils; I only attempt to provide the conditions in which they can learn." Okay, so with that said, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the talk and I'll hand back to Martin to the Q&A session. Thanks a lot, Phil, that was great. Uh, we have a long list of questions. Uh, I don't think we will be able to get through all of them. Uh, just remind you um, of the uh, discussion forum. So if we don't get to your question, uh, please take it there. Now, I'll just start at the top and there's a question from, from Tim. And he wants to know, to what extent do you consider that the work done in the US to develop the NICE framework, uh, which is uh, NIST's special uh, publication 800-180, um, and define the roles, knowledge, skills, abilities, and tasks within that framework, uh, how is it relevant to the UK? Okay, so, so yeah, I mean, there's, there have been um, a lot of other mappings and NICE framework that uh, the work by NIST. Um, there's the IEEE uh, curriculum as well from 2011, is that? Um, and so, I, I mean, I think, you know, they're all relevant in the sense that they all talk about a lot of interesting things. Um, inevitably, you know, the UK want to also come up with their own for what they need. Um, so, I think there is a piece to be done, and this is actually work which Cyboc have been doing about how the Cyboc does align with other existing frameworks. And I guess the, you know, one of the points to make is that with any of these frameworks, it's recommendations and suggestions of what may be in a curriculum, but not necessarily saying you've got to have all of these. And again, if I just think about the work that I know from Cyboc perspective, um, what they are not trying to say, and certainly from NCSE standpoint as well, what they're not trying to say is a master's course in cybersecurity must cover all of these things. But instead they're saying, well, you know, here's a host of things that you may explore, which are you gonna pick from? And again, being able to build this picture of all of these different courses, because that's the thing, there's what, 150 universities call it in the UK, a lot of them offering courses in cybersecurity, how does, how does a student navigate that and understand, well, what is the offering coming from each of those? And that's something where the Cyboc and, and other frameworks really helps to be able to say, well, you know, based on these things that are recommended by industry and the like, um, we focus on these, we focus on those. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of similarities, um, but I guess it's one of those where nothing's ever perfect, but we can compare and contrast against all of these different frameworks. Just to, to follow up on that, um, do you think that there should be some sort of coordination to ensure that the uh, the wider Cyboc is covered by the sum of, uh, say, the UK universities, or is that not necessary? Um, it's a good point. Um, I wonder whether there would be um, coordination between the universities, dare I say, probably not, uh, not, to, not to the level of defining what, what programmes should exist, because they'd probably all say, well, we want to do these interesting subjects and we'll leave it, you know, the less interesting things for someone else, I guess. Um, but I, I think the main thing about it is that it's, it's recognising that what a university is trying to do, you know, fundamentally how universities operate is that the, the subjects being taught align with the expertise of the academics they have. So if you've got academics who are experts in human factors, well, you know, de design a course around human factors. Likewise, if you've got academics who, you know, have done a lot on cyber physical systems, well, again, you know, that tells you where you want to aim a course at. Um, whether we would get to a point where uh, we, well, 
I, I guess that would be for the other universities to look at the picture. And I know this is something that Cybok are doing where essentially all, all NCSC certified universities would say, well, this is our distribution. And then you will, and that will be made publicly available, I should add. And then, you know, another university might look at that and say, right, this is how we can fill the gap that is currently existing. Great, thanks. So uh, another question from uh, an anonymous attendee, um, uh, thanking you for your presentation. And the question is, how can we provide the outreach that you spoke about in terms of engaging with secondary school students in the developing world? So in engaging with secondary school students in the developing world? Yeah. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, I probably wouldn't know enough about it to be able to give an authoritative comment. Um, we're in a fortunate position in Bristol. Um, we've got a good network through the university with our, our regional schools. Um, and that is something that we've essentially just capitalized on and built upon. Um, it's, it's not easy. It's taken a lot of time to, to develop that. Um, in other areas around the world, I guess, you know, I guess in the same way, it's, it's about knowing how universities, for example, in, in other countries, how do they liaise with um, the earlier stages of the education pipeline? And actually, if I may for one minute, um, this is something that the US have actually, um, I would say are leaps and bounds ahead of the UK on, um, if I'm talking with my sissy UK hat on for the moment, because they talk very strongly about building a K through 12 pipeline of cybersecurity. Actually, you know, how is the, the curriculum underpinned through all levels? Whereas HE, FE, secondary has been a lot more segregated in the UK. And this is work which we're actually trying to address so that there is more joined up thinking. Um, there is still a lot of work to be done on that. But I guess, you know, in going back to the original question, how you do this in developing worlds, it really is about understanding, okay, well, you know, if you're in a position within a, a higher education institute, for instance, what, where are your students coming from and how do you network with those institutions and you work your way down from there? Uh, we have to hurry on. Uh, I'll, I'll just grab another one at random here. Um, it's a question from Annika in Sweden. Um, and she wants to know if you have any ideas of how we can encourage graduates from other areas than computer science to take a master's, if they are eligible, in cyber slash information security. Okay. Um, so again, this comes back to that diversity piece, I, I guess, um, because as I say, we, we do need people from all domains joining, you know, joining the fight, if you like, against um, cybercrime. And so you could speak to business graduates and say, well, you know, it's all well and good at understanding business, but if you don't understand the cyber threats that go alongside business, then you're probably not going to run a very successful business for very long. And likewise, you know, reaching out to humanities departments, um, psychology I've picked on already. You've got the likes of criminology, again, an obvious link there. Um, an interesting discussion from a couple of years ago was looking at geographers Geography is one of the subject areas which, you know, from discussions with the NCSC, they say actually they see a lot of people in geography going into conversion courses for cybersecurity because actually they've developed a lot of um, a lot of analytical skills in terms of conducting scientific investigation that actually you know apply very nicely when you then move to a technical domain. So I completely agree. I think the more that any institution can be doing to say, well, look, you know, have you considered a technology based career? Um, because fundamentally, cybersecurity will underpin pretty much all career paths that anyone will follow in the future. Thanks. Now, that's all the time we have. I have a long list of questions that we didn't have time to answer, but luckily there is the forum. Uh, see the link in the chat. So. Uh, that just leaves for me to thank you again, Phil, for a great presentation. And uh, everyone, jump over to uh, the forum to ask your questions there. Thank you.
if you post in the forum, then I'll do my best to work through them. And obviously, you've got my email address. Um, if you want to email me afterwards, then please feel free to do so. so thank you very, very much, everyone, for joining us the session. Thank you also to Martin for chairing. Thank <laughs> you.